The Osmo Pocket 1 was one of my favourite cameras of all time. It was a tiny little technological marvel that impressed me immensely but left me wanting more. The Pocket 2 attempts to satiate those desires, but does it succeed and is it worth upgrading? Well, let's see. In my last video, I said, and now that it's finally been revealed, I'm not sure I want it. I'm not sure I want it. I'm not sure I want it. And if it wasn't for the fact that I reviewed tech gear for a hobby, I probably wouldn't have bought the Pocket 2. But now that I actually have it and I've used it, I feel quite differently and I'm glad I made the switch. The Pocket 2 sticks with the same design as before, this time with a larger camera head and gimbal assembly to house the larger 1 over 1.7 inch sensor. That's 1 divided by 1 decimal point 7 inches. Isn't it time to just switch to millimeters? Anyway, the new body is almost the same as the old, but it's slightly taller and has a slightly flatter curvature on the back. The material quality is just as good as before, with a more chunky all-metal gimbal and a nicely textured plastic body. It still doesn't have a tripod socket built in, but they do include a snap-on tripod adapter in the box, which makes the pocket a little bit longer, but it works and it's better than nothing. The controls are similar to before, except now we have a dedicated power button, and the only reason for that button being separate this time is so that this button can have one extra function. Now when you hold it in, instead of powering the camera off, it momentarily locks the gimbal direction, which is pretty handy sometimes. Included in the box is the smallest, cutest joystick accessory ever made. This lets you pan and tilt, as well as use the digital zoom, which gives you up to four times magnification, depending on the resolution you're shooting in. Normally, I wouldn't be a fan of digital zoom, but for casual filming and vlogging, this will be quite useful and save time when editing later. The speed of the pan and tilt can be customized in the menu. Unfortunately, though, the joystick doesn't provide proportional control. It's either on or off whereas the old optional controller wheel allowed you to change the speed of the pan while you're panning, which produces nicer looking results because you can slow it down right at the end of the movement and avoid that sudden jarring stop. The sensor can capture 64 megapixel JPEGs, which is pretty huge, and they look nice too. Colors are beautiful and sharpness is very impressive. I can't really see myself using a camera like this for photos. I'll only really use it for video and I think most people will be the same, but it's there if you want it. It can also capture panoramas in 3x3 or 180 degrees. Now this is where the camera really starts to show off and I get really excited because the video quality for such a small camera is absolutely stunning. All the video in this review is straight out of the camera unless indicated otherwise. The color science is gorgeous. In standard color mode, everything looks rich and vibrant without being overcooked and fake. It's a very natural color profile that leans subtly towards warmer tones, which I absolutely love. The lens is incredibly sharp and for me, it's slightly too sharp at times. I don't know for certain, but I suspect there's just a touch of software sharpening going on there. There's a log profile called d like which produces a flatter image with more dynamic range and slightly less sharpness and that produces beautiful results if you're willing to spend a bit more time in post. The field of view has had a modest increase from 80 to 93 degrees, and while at first I was disappointed because the stuff I do with my pocket involves a lot of ultra-wide shots, the more I use it, the more I realize that this number is an attempt to find the right balance for most people. It's wide enough to vlog with and to more easily capture pets running around, but not so wide that it looks like action camera footage. DJI sell a new wide angle adapter to increase the field of view to what I would consider ultra wide. I'll probably buy that at a later date. Dynamic range is one of the most impressive aspects for me. Even when pointing directly into the sun, shadow detail is preserved and the scene is beautifully balanced. Auto exposure favors the ground rather than the sky and this is a great thing because the Pocket One used to have problems with scenes like this and sometimes it would completely black out the ground. I can't believe how well the Pocket 2 deals with such contrasty conditions. I'm amazed.
Continuous autofocus is fast and reliable most of the time, but for me it's a bit too fast. I wish I could turn down how quickly it switches focus from one subject to another because with it flicking back and forth or hunting so quickly, it can be distracting and sometimes ruin a shot. Thankfully we have single autofocus mode, which lets you focus on a single subject once and then leave it there so it won't hunt after that. Low light performance has had a big improvement thanks to the larger sensor and larger lens with its f1.8 aperture. I took the Pocket 2 out into the city after sunset to see how it would perform and when I got the footage home I was really quite amazed. It was a lot darker in real life than this footage would have you believe. I can't believe this tiny camera can produce nighttime footage that comes close to that of my RX100 Mark V which has a much larger sensor. So yeah, evening shots in the city this camera can handle it, no worries. One of the weaknesses of the Pocket 1 was when using it indoors in the evening, everything started to look quite grainy and noisy. The Pocket 2 does a much better job, partly because it's just better at low light, but also I suspect there's some cheating going on by way of some fairly heavy software noise reduction. But it's a decent kind of noise reduction that actually improves the footage without making it too smudgy. I love the slow motion in the Pocket 1, and I used it a lot, but it's so much better in the Pocket 2. The wider lens and less of a crop makes it not only smoother, but more cinematic. We have 120 frames per second at 1080p like before, but as I mentioned, this time with less of a crop, and to me it just looks nicer all around and more stable. It's hard to believe that in this scene I'm running over sand, and yet it looks like I'm on tracks. New in the Pocket 2 is 240 frames per second at 1080p, and while the quality is a bit reduced, it's still very usable, at least for the amateur music video stuff that I do. So yeah, I'm loving the slow motion improvements big time. Another significant upgrade is with the audio. I never used the audio captured by my Pocket One, so I never really noticed any problems with it, but I've had many comments on my videos from people complaining about the microphones. Now the Pocket Two has four mics positioned around the top of the body instead of two, and in my brief tests, it sounded pretty good to me. This is an audio test. Let's see how the new four microphones pick up my voice down by this quiet lake. I'm recording at 30 frames per second, 2.7K. The Pocket 2 comes with an upgrade to object tracking called Active Track 3.0, and it's not good. With faster moving subjects, it's so much worse than the Pocket 1. It's jerky and unreliable and easily loses tracking altogether, or points up at random things like it has a mind of its own. This is me doing the same thing in the same location on the Pocket One last year, and it did so much better. Stabilization on the Pocket One was amazing, and now it's even better. 
probably largely thanks to the wider lens and I'm guessing some improved programming too. Walking, running, skateboarding, unicycling, whatever means of travel you're into, they're all going to be smooth and level. Just like the Pocket One, this one almost never loses the horizon and continues to be the most reliable of all pocket size gimbal cameras out there. Transferring over from the Pocket One, we have time lapse, motion lapse, and hyper lapse, and they all work well. I haven't played with those features that much, even on the Pocket One, because it's not something I really use, but in my brief tests, it worked well. Sticking with Osmo Pocket tradition, instead of throwing all the features people wanted into one camera, DJI made some of the most wished for features into separate optional accessories that attach to the camera externally at an extra cost. There's a do-it-all handle which gives you Wi-Fi, a tripod socket, mic input and a receiver for the optional wireless mic. But if you don't want to turn your Pocket 2 into something that looks kind of funny and doesn't really fit in your pocket and you just want the Wi-Fi, you can buy the Wi-Fi module. Or if you want better control over pan and tilt than the included mini joystick can offer, you can buy the controller wheel. The good news is that if you already had those for your Pocket 1, they work perfectly on the Pocket 2. The battery isn't any larger than before, but it still provides me with enough power to get the shots I need on a typical day. But it does run out of steam sooner than the Pocket 1, and the camera gets hotter. This is not surprising given that it's powering a larger sensor, heavier camera head and larger motors. It's just that I find myself now wanting to bring a small power bank with me to top it up, whereas before I never fully drained the battery in a single day when just out and about filming random clips. On its own, the Pocket 2 sadly still doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, so connecting to your phone wirelessly can only be done with the optional add-ons. You can of course connect it physically with the wibbly wobbly smartphone connector like it's 2016. Once connected wirelessly to my phone, I found the connection to be somewhat unreliable and laggy at any distance beyond just a few meters. The Pocket One allowed me to switch the Wi-Fi connection between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz if one frequency band was struggling. In the Pocket Two, this option is missing. My main disappointment lies with the modular design. Every other competitor has made things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and a tripod socket features that are built into the camera. DJI should have at least put Wi-Fi in there. Instead, we have to buy extra accessories. And so you end up carrying a bag with all these extra bits around and trying not to lose them. When I want to put this on a tripod, I have to pull off the bottom and then snap on the tripod mount if I haven't lost it yet. When I want to connect it to my phone, I pull off the tripod mount, which takes so much force that I worry I'm going to break the camera every time. And snap on the other little piece so I can fit it into the Wi-Fi module. Of course you can just buy the do all handle and snap that onto the bottom but I'm never going to buy that thing because, well, you know how I feel about that. As I mentioned earlier, I'm disappointed with the new Active Track. Maybe it's just mine that has an issue, or maybe there's a firmware upgrade coming, but right now it's almost unusable for anything but slow moving subjects. And then there's the new case. There's no tripod socket built into the camera, but there is one built into the case. What? Are we supposed to use it like this? Hmm, hey, this could actually work. With the old case, it was really quick and easy to get the camera out and start filming. Now it's much more difficult because it's jammed in there so tightly, and the only way to get it out is to grab it here and risk damaging the joystick, or to wedge your finger into the bottom and pry it out.
Keeping the tripod adapter attached makes the camera a little bit longer and that gives you a bit more leverage to yank it out with, but it's still not a pleasant experience. And after the 30th time taking it out in a day, you might begin to hate it too. So I really don't like the case. And as soon as a third party manufacturer releases something less annoying, I'll be switching to that. So minor annoyances aside, now that I've had this camera for almost a week and I've used it every day, it turns out I like it a lot more than I thought I would, and I'm really glad I upgraded. The video quality is just so incredibly good. The footage I'm able to get, even just on auto, is gorgeous. The field of view is wider, and the slow motion and low light performance are amazing. And so, once again, I find myself leaving all my other cameras on a shelf, and most of the time just taking this wherever I go. Just the thought of having to fiddle with my heavy, awkward Sony camera gimbal rig to get some steady footage fills me with dread when I know I can just pull this out of my pocket and get something more than just usable with no setup, no balancing and no shoulder pain. But what if you already have the Pocket One and you're happy with it? Is it worth upgrading? Well, I bought this originally just to make this review, but as it turns out, I fell in love with it after about two days but I still consider it more of a Pocket 1.5 than a Pocket 2. If you don't need the wider field of view and the improved slow motion like I did, you might want to just wait for the next iteration, when hopefully we get a fully functional, self-contained camera, rather than a bare bones one with a box of bolt-on attachments we have to carry around just to give us the features we need. But if you're buying your first pocket-sized gimbal camera and you want the best quality footage available and the smoothest, most reliable gimbal mechanism, this is absolutely the one to buy. If you'd like to see my side-by-side -side comparison between the Pocket 1 and the Pocket 2, where you can see exactly what the 2 does better and worse than the 1, make sure you're subscribed because that's my next video. And if you have anything specific you want me to test in that video, or any questions you want answered, leave them in the comments and I'll try to answer them in that video. If you find this useful or interesting, give me a thumbs up, if not for all the hard work I put into it, at least for the cute kittens. And as always, everything you've seen in this video or that I used to make it will be linked in the description below. And some of the links will be affiliate links because I've got to pay off my credit cards someday. Unless I can fake my own death or something. Thanks for watching. See you next time.